the cool night wind blows across my face. I watch as the last light in the windows across the street goes out. My neighbors managed to last quite a bit longer this summer's tide. It's been hours since the festival downtown ended. That hadn't stopped a few people in my neighborhood from coming back home and keeping the party going on their own. That's not unusual, of course. For a lot of people, Somerstide isn't a celebration or a time of remembrance like it was originally intended. Instead, it's an excuse to get wasted and act like they're still in their teens. I sigh as I sit back in my chair on the porch. That isn't really fair. The people of Hollows Grove are, on the whole, good people. They work hard throughout the year and deserve to have an opportunity to release some steam. I turn my head slightly as I hear the door behind me open. I don't turn far enough to actually see the woman coming out onto the porch. I know what expression is going to be on her face, and at this moment, I don't want to see it. Can't, more than don't, really. This is already hard enough without adding my wife's complicated feelings on top of it. She puts a hand on my shoulder. Still without looking at her, I gently place mine on top of it. Still nothing? she asks, a tightness in her voice. No, I answer quietly. Not yet. He'll be here, though. I know. She squeezes my shoulder before sliding her hand off of it. I'm going up to bed. See you soon. Have a good sleep. I won't be sleeping tonight, she says as she goes inside and closes the door behind her. I sigh and go back to staring out into the night. She doesn't like that I'm doing this. She never does. But she's resigned herself to the fact that I'm going to every year. I can't help it. I tell myself every single time that I'm done and that I can't do this anymore. And every single time I find myself sitting on this porch and waiting as the minutes tick by. Tonight is something of a milestone. It marks the 25th year that I've been doing this. A quarter of a century. That's hard to wrap my brain around. It somehow feels that this has and has not been that long. I turn my head as I hear something scrape against the concrete road off in the distance. The breath catches in my throat as I listen intently. After a moment, I hear the sound again. It's time. I reach down next to my chair and pick up the object sitting on the wooden planks next to it. It's a human skull that's been shaped into a lantern. I hate the feeling of the wire handle in my hand, and the weight of the skull pulling against it sickens me. I ignore my discomfort and stand up so that I can hang it from a hook next to the front door. Taking a book of matches out of my pocket, I strike one and use it to light the candle inside of the lantern. The orange glow from the eye sockets causes a shiver to run up my spine. It hadn't been easy to get my hands on this lantern. Replicas were plentiful around Somerstide, but to find a real one was another matter entirely. I take one last look at the lantern before turning away from it. Without it, what I'm doing wouldn't be possible. In a very real way, my life would be easier if I hadn't been able to get it. I would be inside the house with Rachel now, and not out here keeping old wounds open. I walk to the edge of the porch, being careful to stay within the glow of the lantern. I was safe as long as I remained within its radius. A minute passes, and then another. I can still hear the sound coming closer, but the moon is completely hidden behind the clouds, and it's nearly impossible to see anything more than a dozen yards beyond the sidewalk. They're out there, though. Beyond hearing them, I can feel them. They have a certain presence that I can't really describe, but also can't deny. One of them steps into view. I grip the porch railing to steady myself as the young girl slowly shuffles down the street. She's no older than seven, and she's dressed in a costume that I think was once a doctor's outfit. It's difficult to tell for sure. She's covered from head to toe in dirt and grime and it's obscuring much of her clothing. 
either because the light from the lantern has drawn her attention or because she's noticed me in a more unnatural way. The girl turns her head towards me. Her filthy hair falls over the back of her shoulder as she does so. Those eyes, the ones that I can't get out of my dreams, focus on me. The eyes are red and illuminated, as if some unholy light is shining out from behind them. They flicker like flames. The effect looks so much like the glow that comes from the Skull Lantern that it's impossible not to assume that there's some kind of connection between them. This isn't who I'm waiting for, but I do know who she is. Wendy Barnes, age 6, reported missing on the night of Somerstide in 1986. More children come close enough for me to see them in the gloom. They're all dressed in various costumes, and like Wendy, they're coated in filth. I recognize each of them, if recognize is the correct term. I've seen their pictures in newspaper clippings and other records. All of them had disappeared on Somerstide over the last century, and none of them had aged a day since. They all stare up at me on the porch, their fire eyes watching me intently. None of them get any closer than the point where the front lawn meets the sidewalk. They can't. Something about the skull lantern keeps them at bay. More and more children arrive. I identify each of them as they come into view. I'm looking for one particular child, but he hasn't put in an appearance yet. He can't be far behind, though. He has to... There... My jaw tightens, and I feel as if the air has been pushed out of my lungs as I spot the boy. He's dressed like a Power Ranger. The costume had once been green and white, but now it is stained brown. He stares up at me with that same blank look as the other children. Gregory vanished a decade and a half ago during the gathering. It happened in an instant. It happened in an instant. Rachel and I had turned our attention away from him to talk with a neighbor as he was walking up to a house to collect his hazelnuts for the gathering for less than a minute. When we looked back, he was gone. No one saw what happened. Not us. Not the other families. No one. He was just... gone. We called the police, of course. They conducted an investigation, but nothing came of it. Gregory had disappeared without a trace. Losing him. It's indescribable. When you're a parent, you think that you can empathize with other parents that have lost a child. You can't. It's a feeling that you're completely unprepared for and unable to process. There's a gaping wound that won't stop bleeding. I think that we both logically understood that the longer Gregory was missing, the less likely it was that he would ever be found. We still didn't give up hope. That wasn't how that worked. A part of me believes that even if our son's body had been recovered, we still would have held out a small hope that he would somehow come back to us. I know that doesn't make sense. Making sense isn't how any of those kinds of feelings work. A year passed, and Somers Tide came once again. It was an extremely difficult day for both Rachel and I. It being the one-year anniversary of Gregory's disappearance was bad enough. What added to it and made it nearly unbearable were the other families celebrating the holiday all around us. Each child's yell or laugh was a sharp stab into that still raw wound. During the gathering and following festivities, we stayed in the house. We needed those walls between us and the world to make it through the evening. Later that night, though, those same walls became stifling, and we went outside to sit silently in the dark. That's when we saw the procession of children for the first time. I would later learn that it was made up completely of children that had disappeared specifically during Somerstide, but at that time, Rachel and I were completely confused by what we were seeing. I took two or three steps towards them before she grabbed my arm and stopped me. She saw those fire eyes before I did. Her grip tightened as she saw Gregory in that group. That's when either luck or providence stepped in. 
Our first instincts were to run to him, to embrace him and never let him go again. The shock we were feeling kept us rooted to the spot for a pair of heartbeats, though, and that was long enough for our dog Zoe to come bounding out of the house. Gregory and Zoe had been inseparable from the day he had been born. She had basically adopted him as her own, and they would spend countless hours playing together or snuggling up together on the floor. His return had made her more excited than I had seen her for the entire year that he had been gone. She ran up to him happily. We watched in horror as Gregory tore the dog apart with his bare hands. I'm never going to be able to get the image of that out of my head. One minute Zoe was standing there and the next Gregory was... Christ, he just shredded her with his hands and teeth in a way that... I wouldn't have thought possible. He was inhumanly strong. Worse, he seemed to be enjoying himself. Those fire eyes blazed brighter, and he went about the killing with an expression on his face that could best be described as pure rapture. Zoe... Zoe saved our lives that night. If she hadn't come out of the house when she did, what happened to her would have happened to Rachel and me. I have no doubt in my mind about that. As the other children swarmed over the dog's remains and began to hungrily shove bits and pieces of it into their mouths, I forcefully pulled my wife back into the house and locked the door behind us. We didn't go to sleep for the remainder of the night. We kept expecting the children to come after us to smash their way through the front door and do to us what they had done to Zoe. That never happened, though. And by the time the sun rose, the procession had once again vanished. But the only evidence that they had been there at all was a dark stain on the road. You would think that experience would have made me want to never go through anything like that again. Those children were monsters that, as insane as it sounded, clearly weren't human anymore. That's what I felt at first. Things changed over the next year. I thought about the encounter constantly... I kept telling myself that I had witnessed something horrible and savage, and I reminded myself over and over again that Rachel and I would have been slaughtered if things had gone just slightly differently. What I kept coming back to was that, although it was in an impossible and horrible way, I had gotten to see my son one more time. It wasn't closure. Closure isn't really a thing when you've lost a child. It was something, though, even if I wasn't sure what that something was. I changed my schedule so that I could stay up all night to keep watch for Gregory and the other children. I'd sit on the porch from sunset to sunrise, staring off into the darkness and hoping that it would be the night when they would return. I didn't have a plan beyond being as quiet as possible and trying to stay unnoticed. Rachel, she didn't join me. Our experiences on Somers Tide had affected her differently than it had me. Seeing Gregory and his disturbing actions had convinced her that there was no longer any possibility that he was alive, and that was enough for her. She seemed to understand that I needed something different, and while she didn't encourage me, she didn't attempt to dissuade me either. It wasn't until the next Somers Tide that the procession returned to the neighborhood. Just after three in the morning, the group of children came shuffling down the street, their fire eyes taking in their surroundings as they walked. I sat perfectly still in my chair on the porch. I could make out the individual children's shapes, but it was too dark to see any details. All that I could do was sit there in both frustration and desperation as they passed by. It took everything that I had in me not to go running after them in hopes of catching a glimpse of Gregory. There had to be a better way. I spent the following weeks and months looking for an answer. I went to the local historical society and looked through records in an attempt to learn the identities of the other children in the procession. I made a list of every child that had disappeared over the past 30 years and tried contacting their families to see if they knew anything. They had no idea what I was talking about and they all either hung up on me or verbally lashed me for what they believed was a cruel prank. Rachel and I returned home from grocery shopping one day 
to find the town sheriff's car in our driveway. Frank Eddington was the sheriff back then. He was a stern man that didn't put up with much. As soon as he stepped out of the car, I knew that I was in trouble. I told Rachel to go inside while I got whatever this was sorted out. He questioned me about the calls I had been making for a few minutes. At first I tried to be cagey about it, stating that I was still attempting to make sense of Gregory's disappearance. That wasn't technically a lie. He heard me out before staring at me for a long moment. Seeming to come to some sort of conclusion, he asked me point blank if I had seen the filth covered children with the glowing eyes. I didn't have to answer. He must have seen the truth written all over my face. Nodding once, he proceeded to tell me what he knew about the children's procession. It wasn't much. As I'd already worked out, it was made up of kids that had disappeared on Somerstide. While these disappearances always happened on the holiday, they didn't happen every year. They were spaced out across decades. There didn't seem to be any pattern as to when one would happen. Eddington told me to forget about Gregory and the rest of the children. He said that he didn't know exactly what they were, but they were dangerous. They wouldn't hesitate to kill me, Rachel, or anyone else they came across as they walked through town in the hours before dawn during Somerstide. Gregory was gone, and there was nothing that I could do about it. Anger flared in me. If Eddington knew about the procession, that meant he had known what had happened to my son when he had first vanished and had kept that from us. In very vulgar terms, I told the sheriff exactly what he could do with his suggestions. He weathered my emotional storm with that same uncaring look on his face. When I finished, he simply shrugged and said he had done his job by warning me, and whatever happened if I went against that warning was my problem, not his. He offered one final bit of advice before leaving. If I was going to get anywhere near those kids, I needed to find myself a carver lantern. For some reason he didn't know, they wouldn't get close to the light from one. I glanced over at the skull lantern hanging from the hook. It had taken a while, but I had gotten one. Sometimes I wonder whose head it's made from. Most of the time, I just try to forget that it's kept inside my house. Gregory and the other children continued to stare at me with their fire eyes. They're barely moving. Not for the first time, I noticed that they aren't breathing, or if they are, it isn't enough to make their chests rise and fall. Swallowing hard, I go down the three steps from the porch to the short path leading to the driveway. The children not only watch me, but they also move to follow me while still staying outside the lantern light. I can feel the hunger coming from them. Making sure to stop well inside the orange glow, I get as close to Gregory as possible. I've never been this close to the procession before. I kneel down to get a better look at my son. It's difficult to tell for sure because of the grime that covers him, but his skin looks cracked and seems to be coming off in flakes. His eye sockets are more sunken and completely black around the fire eyes. His mouth is hanging a bit open, and the teeth are worn and chipped in many places. The same goes for his fingernails. I look into his fire eyes, and they look back at me as they flicker in their sockets. My heart sinks. Rachel is right. Whatever this thing is, it isn't Gregory. Not anymore. It's just a husk for someone or something else. The wind is picked up, and I shiver as I stand up. No more of this. For 25 years I've hoped against hope that things could be the way they once were. I know now that's not possible. When morning comes, I'm going to smash the skull lantern and bury the pieces. I won't be needing it anymore. A hard gust of wind blows through the yard. For a split second, the light from the lantern flickers. Where I'm standing becomes dark. The children immediately dart forward towards me. At the last possible moment, the light regains its strength and forces them back. I turn on my heel and hurry back to the porch. 
I barely reach the steps before a second gust blows out the lantern's candle completely. My head snaps back towards the procession. It's now too dark to see the children themselves, but their fire eyes are clearly visible as they swarm towards me. I can't go in the house. Rachel is in there. Not knowing what else to do, I run around the side of the building into the backyard. The backyard is fenced in, one of the few reminders of the dog that had once lived there. I reach the gate and quickly insert the key into the padlock. I remove it, dart through the now unlocked door, and close it once again before clicking the lock back into place. The children are so close behind me that one of them scrapes the tip of my finger as I release the padlock. I snatch my hand back out of the fence mesh and take a dozen steps back. The gate rattles loudly as the children pull and push on it in frustration. By some miracle, the lock holds. I pant heavily as the sets of fire eyes spread out further along the fence. The children are starting to surround the backyard. I feel like an antelope being stalked by lions. There's some commotion to my right. At first I think they found a way in, maybe a break in the fence or a section that was slightly raised, but a loud squeal tells me it's something else. A few of the children have discovered a raccoon and are voraciously killing and devouring it. The others begin to climb the fence. I've been hoping that they wouldn't be smart enough to do that, or that maybe their small hands wouldn't allow them to grasp the links properly. That hope is clearly an empty one. The children suddenly stop climbing. The ones that are picking at the last remains of the raccoon cease their feasting. The loud noise of the metal fence clanging against its poles falls silent. All of the fire eyes are turned upward as they look at something behind me. Not sure what is happening, I look over my shoulder in the direction they're indicating. Upstairs in the house, the bathroom light has been turned on. I turn back to the children, but they're already moving back around the fence. In horror, I run back to the gate and pull on it. It's still locked, and at some point I must have dropped the keys. I get down on my hands and knees to frantically search for them. There's a loud crash as the children bash in a downstairs window and flood into the house. Giving up on the keys, I go over to the glass sliding door leading from the backyard into the house and try to pull them open. They are, of course, locked. I pound my hands on the glass and the panes rattle in their frames, but I'm not strong enough to break through. Thinking fast, I remember that there's a stack of wood in the far corner of the yard. We use it in the fireplace on winter nights to help keep down the electric bill. I run over to it and grab one of the heavy logs, intending to use it to smash out the glass from the doors. I'm about halfway back to the doors when I find that I'm too late. Rachel must have heard the window break and come downstairs to investigate. Through the door is the kitchen, and I can see her in there now. Even in the dim glow cast by the light over the stove, I can see her face contorted in fear and pain. Some of the children have grabbed her by the legs. She's struggling with everything that she has, but they're too strong, and more of them are jumping on her back. I'm almost at the doors when she screams. It pierces the night for just a moment, before it goes silent as one of the children tears out her throat with his teeth. I fall back down onto my knees as blood sprays against the glass. The gore blocks much of what is happening to Rachel, but I can see enough. I can't watch this happen to her. I need to look away. I don't, though. This is my fault. My obsession with not letting go... It's killed the woman I've loved since I was a teenager. It's not something that I can turn away from. I don't have any tears to shed over what I'm witnessing. There's nothing in me now. I thought that I lost everything when Gregory had been taken. I hadn't. Now. Now I've lost everything. I'm feeling a kind of numbness that I've never experienced before. I force myself up onto my feet and walk up to the door. 
There's only one thing left to do. I ignore the sights and sounds of what's happening just mere feet away from me and heft the log in my hands. Without an ounce of fear, I swing it into the door. Broken glass slides from the frame like a reflective waterfall before shattering against the kitchen floor and brick patio. The horde of children look up from the torn open corpse of my wife and turn their fire eyes on me instead. As one, they stand up straight, blood dripping from their bodies, and come towards me. I close my eyes with a single nod to myself. When nothing happens, I open my eyes again and look uncomprehendingly into the kitchen. The children are gone. All that is left is a few scraps of Rachel's body and countless bloody footprints on the kitchen tile. Stunned, I turn to face the backyard. Past the fence and just barely above the trees, the sky is lightened ever so slightly, signaling the approach of the coming day. Dropping the log, I feel the internal dam break, and I begin to weep. <laughs>